Um, this song has been my Goliath. Um, I've had it since July. God's gave it to me. And he's revealed something. If I can get this. Um, but he's revealed some things to me this year um, of my own self, of his love. And that's what the song is about. Um, we oftentimes, we acknowledge, yeah, Christ died for us. He was nailed to a cross, but we forget the impact of that. We get upset if we get a thorn in our hand, much less someone got nailed to a cross because he loves you. And that's just what God's taught me this year. And so pray for me as I sing this song. It's my life. I'm going to try to slay it, so... to find me what have I done to deserve love like this what have I done to deserve love like this your voice like a Breaking the silence You say there's a treasure You look till you find it You search To find me
Philippians chapter 2 is where I will be at this morning, Philippians chapter 2. Just one verse this morning, and so after you have found Philippians chapter 2, if you would stand out of reverence of God's word. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. It's one everybody probably knows. And it says this, the word of God. And being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. Because I did not deserve it. And yet you freely gave me love. And Lord, I am so thankful that it was not just me alone, but that you loved the whole world. So I pray, Lord, would you just continue to help us that today while we are here, Lord, may our minds be erased of what happened throughout the week. May our eyes be blinded to who is here and who isn't here. May our ears be stopped with what the world has been screaming at us this week. And may we be here today focused only on you and you alone. And so, Lord, I pray today would your word, not Brother Dwayne's word, but your word, may it be sharper than any two edged sword. And may it cut where it needs to cut. And may it heal where it needs to heal. But Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have your way today in our lives, in our midst. We trust you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A man went west, leaving his wife and son in the New England area, and he told them that when he struck gold out west, that he would send for them to come. Soon, the man had struck gold and had sent for them, and they boarded a boat and headed toward San Francisco. But it was not long after they were out on the open seas that they heard the scream, fire, fire. And on board of that big boat was a powder keg. And the captain knew that once the fire reached that, that no one on board would survive. The lifeboats were launched and they were put out, but there were too few and they were too small. As the last boat was pushed away from the large boat, a mother and her son stood on the side. And she pleaded, the man in the boat, please take us. 
He looked at her and said, I'm sorry, we can't take any more. And then she sat there and she said, please take us. And finally the man saw it in her eyes and he said, I can take one more. She grabbed up her son. She held him close. And tossed him in the boat. She says, if you live to see your daddy, tell him that I died in your place. Man, this morning, I want to preach a message called, Why the Cross? Mm. Here in Philippians... We see a man that is writing a letter from prison bars. <laughs> oh, me. How messed up even was society back then? <sighs> writing letters from a prison bar, but we find a man who was joyful. <laughs> We find a man who was excited. We find a man who was happy. We find a man that was at peace with the letters that he wrote. A man who was ready to live. And yet at the same time, a man who was ready to die. Chapter 1, verse 21. Of the same letter. Can I ask you this morning? Are you ready to live? But at the same time ready to die? (laughs) Oh, I hope so. Here is a man who is concerned about Christians living the Christian life. He was not worried about his circumstance. He was not worried about his well-being. He was not worried about how everything was going to play out on his behalf so that he would be able to be successful, live in a place of comfort, but yet was a person who was so deeply under conviction of what the power of God had done in his life that he could not rest knowing that others needed Jesus just as much as he did. He would tell the people that they needed a mind transplant in chapter 2, verse 5. Man. You see, it's one thing to have transplants that we see today be brought about, but I, can I tell you something? It's much different to have a mind that has been transplanted and transformed by the power of an almighty God that enables you to live in a society that is messed up as much as we are today. He then begins to talk about who and what Jesus had did for them what he has done for us, and what he will do for all. This is a man behind prison bars because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He would talk of the man named Jesus who left the splendor of heaven and had come to earth as a servant Not to be served, but to serve. My, how in the church, from here all the way down, do we need to swallow that pill just one more time? In verse 8, we find this whole thing about the cross. See, I don't know if we really grasp or understand even as much 
of a history buff as a lot of people may be. I like history, but for us truly to grab hold of who the Romans were. Rome was not just some small place. It wasn't something that just had a few people. It wasn't something that would every now and then have some type of power. But we're talking about a Roman government that conquered the world that they would know it at the time. And one thing for sure was that the Romans were good at torture and they were good at death. They were trained in that. They were trained in that so much that they used it on their own people. Severe beatings, floggings, being branded on the forehead, gouging out the eyes, ripping out the tongue, cutting off ears, just to name a few. And we think we have cruel and unusual punishment today. I'm not saying these things were right. I'm just saying sometimes we do not understand what other people had to go through. We have it made compared to the ones who went before. The strangest that I read as I studied of the Romans and the cruelty that they had. One of the strangest things that I came across was this type of punishment. It was one that would be sold and bound in a sack that was very heavy. And inside that snack, inside that sack, they would be bound. But also inside of that would be a snake, a rooster, a monkey, and a dog. And you say, what in the world? Would it, could you imagine the chaos inside of that sack? Throwing all of those things in there. And the prisoner being bound and could not get free. But see, that wasn't enough because after they did all that, they threw them in the river and they sank to the bottom. All of those together. Whew. Oh boy. The death penalty was something that they carried out and that they were pleased with. The death penalty was something that they took pride in. Because the death penalty was something that scared people to death, especially in the Roman era. <laughs> the death penalty included things like being buried alive, impaling, and of course the one that we most know about, crucifixion. So this morning I ask you, why the cross? Why the cross? Paul points that Jesus was obedient in verse 8. Jesus was not just obedient in listening to the Father, in hearing the Father, in doing the Father's will, as we find spoken of all throughout the Gospels. Instances that we see Jesus that would stop and take time to kneel in the sand and write with his finger as he heard from the Father. A, a man that would wait and make sure that everything that he spoke came directly from him because he did not want to say anything contrary to the Father. Paul says that this man Jesus was obedient, but Paul makes it a point to make sure that that obedience did not stop with the word, but went all the way even to the point of death. <laughs> if you were to move outside of this writing of the Philippian letter, 
that Paul would have. Paul would call us out once again to be obedient even to death. Would be obedient till our very last breath could be had. Not a breath crying out for mercy. Not a breath that cries out for forgiveness. But a breath that cries out to see our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. And he doesn't stop with that. Why does Paul continually make this point? Because to read this, you would think it would be well sufficient enough for us to understand because we are smart enough in the 21st century to put two and two together. And yet, Paul would spell this out to not only say that he was obedient even unto death, he would go on to say, even death on a cross. Mm, man. In the world around us, if you were to talk to people and ask how are they saved or how to be saved, somewhere in that conversation, you know what will come up? The cross. The cross. It will be spoken about some way, some shape, some form. You see, the cross would be considered the ultimate death penalty of the time. The torture, the pain, the agony was not like anything else anyone would go through. Even outside of the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, there are non-biblical accounts that prove that the crucifixion actually happened. Atheists will not deny that the crucifixion did not happen because they cannot deny even what the world has written about. And they struggle to be able to explain this aspect of the cross. But the sad part is, so does the church. There are many accounts of the man named Jesus not just in the Gospels, but outside of that. The cross would be one thing that everyone knew about, sinner and saint alike, even during the Roman era. Even after the Roman era, this thing of the cross, they would still remember how cruel that the Romans were. That the ultimate price, the death penalty in the Roman government would be crucifixion. And every time they would hear about the crucifixion, the cross, they could not escape remembering a man called Jesus, sinner and saint alike. You may still be asking this morning, but pastor, why the cross? Why the cross? Well, it's not because we understand what truly death on a cross is like. Because I'll tell you this, I've never witnessed anyone dying on a cross. I've never seen the death penalty inflicted in that sort of way. I've never seen anyone that had to hang there. And all of the movies and everything else that you could watch, understand this, they're still not real. It's a movie. Even the passion of the Christ, and as good a job as what he did, trying to give us the account of those last moments of Jesus Christ, does not do justice to the pain and agony of the cross. You see, we can't grab hold of that. The closest thing that I probably could ever get to understanding in that aspect of really the pain that may be there. It's not even on my account. It's not anything that I've been through because the worst pain that I could tell you of wouldn't compare to that. But I remember oh, one day as my dad was driving in a steel post. And he had it and he was raising it up and he was hitting it and he went too far and the post went up through his hand. And ripped it all to pieces, 56 stitches inside and out in his hand. 
And from the pain that he could tell me about, it's the closest that I could get to maybe understanding the pain of the cross, of a nail. Of how that would feel hanging there by that. (laughs) Man, the cross. You see, it doesn't happen anymore. The death penalty is not carried out this way. You see, it's not to scare people into submission of Christianity. That's not what the cross is for. (laughs) Then why, Pastor, why the cross? One reason is this, because God saw it from the beginning. As hard as it is for us to comprehend it, God always saw the cross the cross you see it was prophesied about we have Old Testament scriptures that would tell us about what the cross would be long before they understood what it would be oh me you see the cross Why the cross? Because it'd be the start of a new covenant. Oh, we've heard about that. You say, Pastor, you're not telling us anything new. Oh, I'm really never going to tell you anything new because there's nothing new that I could give to you. It's already been given. I can't come up with something that will be better because there's nothing better. There's nothing better. This start of the new covenant. You see the writer of Hebrews makes it known in chapter 10 verse 4. He would say it like this. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It is impossible. Which means it's not possible. Which means... It would never happen. Which means as long as God saw fit to see the earth survive in the way that it was, it would never be sufficient no matter how much blood was shed. No matter how much blood was shed from the bulls and goats. You see, we must understand this morning that it's always been about the blood. And maybe you're saying, the blood, I thought you said it was about the cross. Oh, yes, I did. I said it's about the cross. Oh, but it's about the blood just as much. You see, we have to understand the cross sometimes. We have to understand the cross and not look at it because we look at it and we don't see an old rugged cross. We look at it and we see a pretty cross. We look at it and we don't see splinters. We look at it and can rub it and nothing happens to our hand. We look at it and it's beautiful. We look at it, but can I tell you, that's not the cross. That's a man-made cross. It just happens to be A symbol that we use, but it's not the cross. Because when it really comes down to it, we can't bear to look at the cross. Because truly it reminds us. It reminds us on those days when we did the thing that we shouldn't do. Well, you have trouble looking at the cross. You spoke the word you shouldn't have spoke. You have trouble. Why? Because the cross reminds us. You see, it's not a pretty cross. Oh, It's a cross to be looked on that actually, it can make your stomach churn. It can make it hurt some. Almost could make you nauseous. Understand this part of it. You can't have the cross without the blood. You can't have the cross without the blood. But you can try to get the blood without the cross. 
Can I tell you the difference? The second one won't work. The only way to get the blood is to get the cross. And we have too many people that want to plead the blood that never went to the cross. And I ain't talking about the sinners of the world. I'm talking about church pews even this morning. Because we don't look at the cross for what it really is. We want to think about what it had done. And we want to only partake in what had happened without actually going to the place where it did happen. To be part of it. Understand this. You have to remember just as I did. I nailed him to the cross and so did you. You were there. You were, as much as you want to deny that you were there, as much as you want the scientific, analytical aspect of it to say there is no way that I was there 2,000 years ago, almost to the time that I could say that I was so all but understand. It was you just like it was me. But you see, the problem is we want to get away from the cross because the cross makes us actually feel what we're truly worth, which is actually nothing. Because it's the blood that makes us something. You can't have the blood without the cross. It's about time we shape up and actually accept it for what it is. Instead of wearing the cross and taking God's name in vain. Did you realize that if you wear a cross on your body, on your shirt, have it in your home, and you're not living what the cross is about, then you have just taken God's name in vain. We say it's only when you use the words. Oh, no, no, no. It's when you don't even live right. You've taken God's name in vain because you're saying that God lived that way because you're supposed to be Christ-like and you're supposed to be the example. And so if you're not living that way, then you just took his name in vain without ever saying a word. Lord, can I tell you, if we don't get back to the cross, we can plead the blood all day long. But the only way you get the blood is get to the cross. Come on, you say it, it, it ain't even got hard yet. I ain't even got to it yet. <laughs> no, some of you are like, da, 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 da. you know, I wish I could preach one of those messages. Where it almost felt like we were hanging over hell and all that was holding on was a thread so that we could understand what the cross really means. Because we pushed it all away. Now we just live in a fairy tale of Christianity. Because we want all the fluff without getting to the cross. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Mm. Why the cross? Why the cross? It's because of what it points to. It's because of who it points to. Never put yourself on the cross. Listen to me. It's a big temptation. You say, Pastor, I would never... Do oh, oh, oh. Uh, Listen to me, if there's pride in your life, can I tell you what pride is? Pride means you're first. You know what that means? That means that you're still trying to accept that you did something on the cross. And it wasn't me and it wasn't you. It was Jesus. Oh, come on. We're getting there. We're getting there. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 7 says this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, isn't that good? Everybody loves that verse, but you can't stop. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. <laughs> That's awesome, but you can't stop. You know what it says right after that? It says this, and the blood of Sean. <laughs> it doesn't say your name, does it, brother? Can I tell you, there ain't nobody's name in there except the one who actually did it. Come on, don't put your name in there. Don't think you're holier than thou, just like I can't think I'm holier than thou. We've got to read the verse for what it really means. And it says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. You can listen. You can't have the blood till you get to the cross. 
We've got to be there. It's ugly. Why do you think only one disciple went all the way? And us so-called disciples, starting from here all the way down, don't want to go to the cross. We try to make ourselves feel better because we said only one did, and he was holding on to Jesus' mother. It was the disciple of whom he loved. But can I tell you, that's no excuse. Just because the 11, the 10 others didn't go doesn't mean that we shouldn't. It actually means we should be like the one and go to the cross. And we should stand there and we should look at it for what the cross is really like. Now listen to me. I'm not saying that we crucify him again because, no, you can't do that. It's once for all. He's done. You can't crucify him again. But I'll tell you this, don't you ever forget what he did. Don't forget what he did because when you forget what he did, you don't go to the cross. You just try to get in the blood. And on that day, he'll say, depart from me for I never knew you because all you did, you tried to waller in the blood. But the blood did you no good till you get to the cross. Oh, boy. Man. Lord, help me. I pray this morning. <laughs> We continue to go with this word. You see, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 would even say this. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now watch this. He's talking about pastors and leaders in the church. If you're a leader in the church, which means if you're going to play some music, if you're going to sing some music, if you're going to teach a Sunday school class, then guess what? Step up. That's what Acts 20, 28 says. And if you don't want to step up, step out. Because watch what happens. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I didn't do it. You didn't do it. But what he said was this. If you get to the cross and understand what I did and then you get in the blood, then I'll tell you this. There is something you've got to do. You've got to make sure everybody else gets to the cross. Don't say, oh, it's running down and you can get in it. No, 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 no. no. Too many people want to stand afar off and try to get it. But you ain't going to get it till you get close. I better not go there. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. Let's go Old Testament, right? Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. Watch what God says. For the life of a creature is in the blood. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now watch this. I told you earlier what the scripture said about the new covenant that he brought in. Oh, you see what God did? Here's, understand this. From the beginning, God saw the cross. But you see, if you don't get in the Old Testament, then you don't understand what the cross is about. You're trying to read in the New Testament, and guess what? Did you realize that Paul and Peter, writer of Hebrews, goes to the Old Testament more than what they come up with stuff in the New Testament? Why? Because it's always been about the cross. God says, this is what I need you to understand. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. Oh, boy, getting over in Revelation. Now everybody starts shaking, right? You get in Revelation. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. It says this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Man, it's a powerful, powerful verse. And they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. How'd they conquer him? By the blood of the Lamb. How'd they get the blood of the Lamb? They went all the way to the cross. Quit selling Jesus short of what he did on the cross thinking that you can plead the blood without ever getting there. 
You wonder why there's no victory in your life? You wonder why there's nothing there that you can look back on to truly say, I know when God made a difference, it's because you stopped short. You tried to wallow around. Listen, you tried to wallow around in someone else's blood. You can't wallow in mom and daddy's blood. You can't wallow in the pastor's blood. you got to get all the way to the cross of the one who actually shed it. Because if you think somebody else did it for you, you ain't going to make it to heaven. Why the cross? Man, some of you right now, you feel like you're dangling over hell, don't you? Some of y'all are like, I can't believe you said that. Well, I can't believe there ain't more people at the altar already. <laughs> That's just me. But I know that everybody's right with the Lord and everybody's sitting in this room. If God were to come right now, you're going to make it to heaven. Lord, help us all. You say, Pastor, are you judging? <laughs> you better read your word. <laughs> Just saying. It's hard for me to take care of the sheep if I don't know what's going on with them. Whoa. Move on, move on, brother. But the greatest scripture I think that we could ever pull out of it to understand why the cross. Why the cross. Man, some of y'all are so uncomfortable that right now you're trying to do everything you can to get away from what the word says. Can I tell you this? I don't care if you leave, get in your vehicle and drive to New Mexico. Can I tell you this? You can't get away from the cross. Because he'll deal with you until you go all the way. Mm. Dave and Dustin, you gonna come on up? I want you to start playing. See, I believe one of the greatest verses that could help us to understand why the cross. You see, we look at the cross too many times. We don't understand why the cross. We just like to talk about the cross. We like to associate the cross with Jesus, not understanding what Jesus actually did. Oh, we talk about the cross in the aspect of, well, we, Jesus, I think, died on that cross. We're not even sure sometimes. We allow the world to affect our thinking way too much. We've got to be sure where we stand. We've got to know what the Word of God says. <laughs> because I'll tell you this, the world will play with your mind. Because that's what Satan loves to do. And did you realize... That if you're not careful before next week, you'll doubt some of the things about Christianity. Because the news you watch, the TV shows that are on, can I tell you, the music that you listen to will tell you everything contrary to what the Word of God says. And it'll mess with your mind and you'll start doubting what the cross was all about. Mm. You see, there's this passage of Scripture in the Old Testament that helps us to understand Jesus before Jesus came on the scene. We get it. <laughs> it was given to us. The prophet really couldn't even wrap his mind around it because it hadn't happened yet. And what's our excuse today? What's our excuse today for not being able to understand the Word of God? We have the Holy Spirit. The greatest teacher that has ever been. And it's freely given to all who want that. <laughs> to be able to help us understand. Understand what? Even the cross. Because in the church too many times. We bypass the cross to try to get to something else. But you can't have anything else till you get to the cross. It's the cross. You know why the cross well, I talked a lot this morning. I told you about the blood. But do you understand the blood? If someone on the street were to ask you, what about the blood? What's it really do? Is there anything in that? What could we do? We're supposed to be the body of Christ. We're supposed to help the ones who are searching for the answer. <laughs> And I'm afraid that too many times if somebody were to say, why the cross, we'd struggle. Because you see, it's so much more than just the fluff and the tip of the iceberg that we get too many times. So this morning, I wanted to go just a little bit deeper. 
of why the cross. Isaiah 53. Well, it gives us an insight like we've really never had before. Even into the New Testament. You see, this prophet would be prophesying what the coming Messiah was going to do. And he didn't even understand the coming Messiah. He would begin to prophesy about what this one man would do for him, though he wouldn't be able to see it. And in Isaiah 53, we find this verse. It's verse 5. Oh, you've heard it. But you know what? We should be so tired of just hearing the word. Oh, we should want it so deep in us. We should want it on the tip of our tongue. You see, I think they had it right in the Old Testament. When God would tell them, write it on your doorpost. Put it on your forehead. Talk about it when you rise and when you go to sleep. And Lord, help me. Because I even want to do that more. And more and more. But Isaiah 53, it gives us this insight of why the cross. What a beautiful cross we have. But Isaiah 53 says it's anything but beautiful. (laughs) Isaiah 53 verse 5. The King James Version says it good. I'm going to read it in the way that the King James Version says it. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. That he was wounded. Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And with his stripes, We are healed. Oh, Isaiah. Prophesying scripture that really at the time he couldn't even understand the impact that it would make at Lancaster Church of the Nazarene in September on this Sunday morning. Can I tell you a quick story? There was an ungodly sea captain. (laughs) And death now was staring him straight in the face. And he lay back in his bed knowing that this time death was coming. He knew eternity was close, and it would not be long. A man by the name of Captain Couts sent for his first mate. And he said, Williams, please get down on your knees and pray for me. I've been very wicked. And as you see, I'm getting ready to die. And he said, I'm not a praying man, Captain. <laughs> I can't pray. I would if I could, but I can't pray. He says, well, then bring me a Bible to read. Bring it to me for just a little bit. Well, my life's about done. 
I don't have a Bible, Captain, either. I'm not a religious man. He said, send for Thomas, the second mate. Go get him. Perhaps he can pray for me. Soon he came in. He said, Thomas, I'm afraid that this time eternity is here. It's real. It's coming for me. Get down and pray for me. Ask this God to have mercy on my soul. He said, I'd gladly do it, Captain. I would. But I'm not prayed since I was a little boy. I can't pray. He says, do you have a Bible? He said, no, Captain. I don't read. They searched all over that ship. Until finally, one of the sailors had came by and said, you know what? I'd seen a cook's boy. He's just a little lad running around. He had something that looked like a Bible. And the captain said, go get him. Go get that boy. And once that little boy came walking in to the captain's quarters. He said, son, do you have a Bible? He said, yeah. He said, only read it. He said, only read it when everything's done. He said, oh, that's okay. He said, would you open it up and find something that would bring peace to this old captain? The boy turned in his Bible and he sat down and he says, Captain, there is one chapter that me and my mom used to love to read together. He said, it's in Isaiah, it's chapter 53. He said, would you like for me to read it to you? He said, please read it to me, boy. Please read it to me. turn and he began to read chapter, four, chapter 53 he got the verse 5 he got the verse 5 and he said and he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed and the captain screamed and said that's it that's it boy read it again Read it again. And so the boy stopped. And he read it one more time. And the next time the captain said, would you read it one more time? And he said, well, captain. He says, there's one thing that my mama taught me to do. He said, my mama taught me to put my name in there. He said, can I do that when I read it this time? He said, oh, yes, son. He said, put your name in there. And he said, he was wounded for Willie Platt's transgressions. He was bruised for Willie Platt's iniquities. The chastisement of Willie Platt's peace was upon him. And by his stripes, Willie Platt is healed. And he said, oh, son, would you read it again and put your captain's name in there? Put Captain John Counts in that verse. Would you read it? And he said he was wounded for John Counts' transgressions. He was bruised for John Count's iniquities. And the chastisement of John Count's peace was upon him. And by his stripes, John Count 
is healed. And when he got done, the captain laid back on his pillow. And he said, that will do, my boy. That will do. As he laid back on that pillow, the captain continued to repeat Isaiah 53, verse 5, over and over and over again. And before this man, Captain John Couts, died, he had witnessed to every person on that ship of what Jesus Christ's blood and the cross could do for them. I ask you this morning, did you put your name in it? Because your name goes there. And my name goes there. And he did that for me. And he did that for you. And understand this. You can't get away from it. Understand this. The biggest atheist in the world. Cannot get away from Isaiah 53 verse 5. I remember running and I ran till I couldn't run anymore. And I was that captain. And I put my name in that verse. And the only reason that I'm here today, the only reason, is not because of my mom and dad, not because of my wife, not because of my children. Not because of a board, not because of what the church voted. The only reason that I stand before you today is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, that my name was plastered all over it. And this morning, If I could beg and plead any more than what I already have. If I believed that God could do anything more than what he's already done for every person sitting in this room. I'd ask him to do something else. But he's already done it. And one day, when God said enough is enough. Isaiah 53 verse 5 was fulfilled. And Jesus Christ went all the way. And Paul says that he was obedient even unto death. Even death on the cross. Where you should have been. Where I should have been. He took our place. Today you can't run. And today you can't hide. As we were driving to church this morning... My children had noticed something on the side of the road next to Camp Dick School at the red light. Off in the distance, there's a telephone pole that sits over there. And it's over where the old road used to be at. Oh, you all know it that live here. A lot better than me. But I need you to understand something about that old road over there. That old road, though, it's no longer drove on. 
that old road over there that it almost seems like it's just desolate and it's no longer of any value and there's no use for it. As we were coming from Danville this morning and we got to the red light and we pulled out. Which one was it? Madison. Usually one of our children. Looked out the window. God brings everything together. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about my message this morning. I'm talking about the songs. Nobody knew what I was preaching this morning until I gave my message Friday, right? I gave the sermon title to you. Debbie, you knew it. Alan, you knew it. Nobody else knew it. And yet, somehow God saw fit to put together the songs that we needed in the place that it needed to be for you to sing about love that we can't even understand. A song that you've never sung. And yet we see it put up here that everything that it comes to, even driving on a Sunday morning, when it's rainy, with three kids in your vehicle, and one of them looks out the side, and on the old road, behind the boats, that if you look hard enough, and you look long enough, you'll see a telephone pole that has been engulfed with all the greenery, that makes it to the exact point that looks just like a cross. I want you to understand something. You and you and you and you and you and me will never, ever be able to escape the cross. You can run to the pit of hell and you can't escape the cross. Because it's always been about the cross. I remember, I'm almost done, but I'll tell you this. If you're dangling over the pit of hell right now by a thread, the altar's open. I remember an old preacher. And he said, I'd done a lot of work and I'd get under houses. He said, I was running from the Lord. I didn't want anything to do with him. And he said, I'd grow under houses and I'd inspect them and I'd spray them and I'd do all these things. I was just doing a side job. Just trying to make money. And he said, one day the Lord was so heavy on me, I was doing everything I could to distract myself of what he was wanting to do, of who he was, of what he was speaking. And he said, I got under that house, and he said, I'll be safe under here. And he said, he got under there, and he laid on his back, and every which way he turned, all he saw was the cross. Because I don't know if you know much about being under a house. But all the beams run together, and no matter where you go, it's the cross. Understand this. You and me will never escape the cross. As you come and lead us this morning. If you walk out of here this morning and the Lord is dealing with you and you walk out Lord have mercy on your soul because you're not guaranteed the next breath you say oh pastor you're trying to scare us to death I'll tell you what church we need to be a little bit more scared we're so flippant about this whole thing called Christianity no wonder nobody wants it and we sit here and we come to church on a Sunday morning and we'd rather be at home watching a football game, basketball game, a golf match or something else. And then we try to say that we really care about the cross. You see, the reason I preach the message about the cross this morning is because the church doesn't understand the cross. We can do all we want to with the world, but I'll tell you what, if you never get them to the cross, you can take them to the blood all day long. It ain't going to do no good. Listen to me, church. It's about high time that we repent and get to the cross so that we can actually make a difference in the world.